Good afternoon, everyone. This is Terry Cash with the National Dropout Prevention Center, and I'm here with my co-host and colleague, Marty Duckenfield, also with the center, and we welcome all of you to, the, to this monthly radio webcast brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center at Clemson University in partnership with Clemson Radio Productions and the generous support of Penn Foster. Hey, Terry, are you noticing there's something different today? you got to have a good ear to notice it, but we have a new theme song, and we are so excited about this. It was written just for this show by Hamilton Allstadt of Clemson University Department of Performing Arts. Thank you. The name is yet to come, but right now it's the theme to Solutions. And I joined Harry in welcoming all of you this afternoon to this live broadcast to Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. I know many of you are returnees, and many of you are new, and so welcome. We have a great program planned for today. So let's get started. First of all, as usual, I need to remind our listeners of the materials that are provided on the website for today's program. There is the slide presentation, which is, in fact, a PowerPoint to support today's discussion. So have that open and ready. We also have a variety of other resources on this web page, including several PDFs, some organization website links, uh, links to some books and publications, And um, our pride and joy this time, a two-part video of a site visit to the Middle College High Schools in Guilford County, North Carolina. And if anybody from Guilford County is listening, thank you all. You were great hosts, and we had a terrific time up there. We want to encourage all of you listeners to be an active part of the program today. So we have two ways you can connect to us. Because this is a radio call-in show, we encourage you to call in your questions for our guests. Our toll-free number is... And we'll repeat this often, 888-539-8859. And if you're calling from outside the U.S., Terry, this hasn't happened yet. I know, but maybe today's the day. 864-656-4550. You can start calling now or any time during the program, and we'll put you on hold for a few minutes, and then we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can during the broadcast. We also accept email questions sent to our email address, which is NDPC, as in National Dropout Prevention Center, NDPC, at Clemson.edu. And please put the word solutions in the subject line. It'll catch my eye, and I'll be able to pull in your question for our guest today. Well, thank you, Marty. We do look forward to your calls. This National Dropout Prevention uh, Dropout Crisis didn't happen overnight. And although the bad news is that there's no quick fix, no, ma- no magic bullet to end it, the good news is that we know that there are many solutions to the problem. And a solution we're focusing on today relates to the meeting the needs of students who seem to just slip away. They once uh, had shown great potential, but as they grew older, they got more and more disengaged from school. Uh, joining us today from San Diego, California, is their super- two superintendent of schools, Dr. Terry Greer. Dr. Greer was formerly superintendent in Guilford County, North Carolina, when that district initiated a variety of middle college high schools, meeting the needs of hundreds of these disengaged young people, and having great results with this approach. We welcome Terry to the program today. Well, it's certainly good to be here, and Terry, it's good to to hear you and and Marty, and uh, I look forward to joining the program, and hopefully we can offer some insights that might be helpful. Well, thank you. We uh, we look forward to it as well. And this program is is actually a follow-up to your recent uh, Effective Strategies book published by the National Dropout Prevention Center entitled Middle College High Schools, A Meaningful Option for Disconnected High School Students. Um, what initially led you uh, to be such a strong advocate for the middle college as an at-risk intervention strategy? Well, you know, Terry, I was a former high school principal and high school teacher, and just seeing firsthand how many children we were losing, and for whatever reason, not being able to reach them or meet their needs. And many times these kids were very bright, but they just didn't seem to to understand how relevant school could be to their future. Uh, They were kids that, for whatever reason, just didn't want to come to school. They didn't have a strong relationship with their their teachers, and we were losing them. Dropout rates were, were going through the roof, and what was so unfortunate about it is I don't really think a lot of people cared. Uh, maybe they just uh, didn't see the problem, or if they saw it, uh, these kids that were so different, uh, maybe it was to some of them just easier if they weren't in school. And I can recall when uh, even a former school board member in a district where I worked made the comment to me that, well, maybe the problem was that uh, 
some kids that should drop out uh, hadn't yet because they were getting in the way of the kids who wanted to learn. And it's that it was that type of very painful attitude and experience that helped me realize that we had to do something different with high schools. The high school model we had was a, a model that was designed way back pre-World War II. And uh, it's meeting the needs of a lot of kids, Terry, but it's not meeting the needs of, of many others. I agree. And certainly that message comes out loud and clear in your book. And uh, I would encourage our listeners to uh, take a look at that. Uh, you can find it on our website at dropoutprevention.org. Well, you also brought a lot of other very useful uh, information. Let's just get started with that. Um, and uh, I'll just turn that over to you if you want to uh, go through your slides. or have Sure. Uh, we just refer our listeners to the so slides that are on the web page and just basically talk briefly about the history and purpose of the Middle College program. This is not a new initiative. It really uh, began in 1974 at LaGuardia Community College of the City University of New York. And they designed a program that they believe would create a learning environment on a college campus that provides disengaged high school students with a fresh start. Now, you're going to hear a lot of people that talk about middle colleges use the word disengaged to, dis to, to basically identify students. Um, a lot of the students that go to middle college high schools do not like to have those schools referred to as um, alternative schools. Uh, they don't want to be referred to as uh, former problem students. The word disengage basically means these kids don't participate in any extracurricular activity at their traditional high schools. Uh, we found that most of them do not play sports. They're not in the annual staff. All the annual staff, they don't participate in uh, any of the, the extracurricular activities. And that was the one thing that we found most of them had, had in, in, in common. They also were, were pretty creative. And they just felt like they were square pegs trying to fit into the round hole of traditional high schools. And often because of their dress or a lack of interest in school activities, their peers uh, simply rejected them. Uh, I can uh, recall one high school student that was uh, ended up going to a middle college and graduating. He failed every course he had taken during uh, his uh, sophomore year in high school with the exception of physics. And he'd made an A in this physics teacher's class. And when I interviewed and talked with him, he said, well, yeah, he's cool. He liked me and liked kids like me for who we are. He didn't judge my clothes. He didn't judge my hairstyle. He's just a cool guy. And I think that that really describes these, quote, disconnected students or disengaged students um, to a T. Uh, many of them are bright, uh, and, and some of them it's really interesting. Some of them are, are sons and daughters of doctors, of lawyers, of very, very, very successful business people. Uh, others have purple hair. Some have tattoos and, and body, they, they have body piercing that they – but the one thing that they all seem to have in common is this whole concept of, of being disengaged. And this model does a marvelous job of pulling these kids back into the educational process. Also, what's interesting uh, about this is that successful middle colleges, uh, the grade levels vary across the country. I know in Guilford we had some middle colleges that were ninth, served ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. Uh, others served 11th and 12th graders. We started some one program that uh, started that serves kids in the 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. And their senior year, they enroll in a community college and take all community college courses for dual high school college credit. So it was 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 an interesting design. Uh, another uh, byproduct for the colleges and universities is that it often provided those host colleges with a new pool of potential students. Uh, in Guilford, where we had six middle college high schools on college campuses, about 66% of these students, uh, and it took several years to get there, but about 66% of those students ended up uh, continuing their education on the camp at the college where they were enrolled. And so that, uh, I think, was exciting for a lot of the, the colleges as far as having a, 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 a pool of future P, uh, students. We also found that the key to the middle colleges in Guilford was a small student enrollment. 
And Gladwell wrote a book. He's a, a professor here at the University of uh, Southern California. He wrote a book uh, several years ago called The Tipping Point. And in that book, he described through, his, through different types of research how many humans could interact together in a, in a group before you started having to have rules, regulation, law enforcement, uh, those kinds of things. And he found that that number was around 150. It's an interesting little book. It's an easy read. Uh, so we decided in the middle colleges at, at, at Guilford County that we would try to keep those, small, those schools small, between 125 and 150 students. And, Terry, I can tell you, every time uh, we let those student enrollments creep up around 150 or a little over 150, all of a sudden we started experiencing what the kids refer to as drama. Mm -hmm. uh, kids started shoving each other. They started pushing each other. We started having fights. The uh, kids became defiant. We kept those numbers down around 140, 145 kids. Uh, no problems. As a matter of fact, last year uh, we didn't have a single suspension at a middle college high school in Guilford County. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the college presidents uh, would tell you they didn't even know the kids were on campus. And over the years, this, this concept has really grown in popularity. And the last four or five years, the Gates Foundation have, has put a lot of money into what they referred to as um, middle, early college high schools, which philosophically are a bit different. But we've seen that number grow from 10 years ago, you had maybe 35 or 40 middle colleges, to now uh, you, you have – over 200 programs across the the nation, and I really believe now it's more would, would, would be we'd be closer to, to 500. So that's that's a, a little bit of the history and uh, the purpose of the the concept. You know, um, I got to call you Dr. Greer because I got two Terry's to deal with here. <laughs> uh, Dr. Greer, I noticed on our trip up to Guilford County. Uh, and we just visited three of the sites, but they were each so different. Yes. And um, you know, there were some certain core values, certain core components, and yet there was that flexibility. And I wonder if you could just discuss that, because I, I had this feeling that that might account for the success. Well, it's no, no question. Uh, they all have to be able to be flexible and be different. For example, uh, one was on the campus of a um, private liberal arts college, and that school began at 8 o'clock in the morning and ran until 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, many of the others were on college campuses and began at 11.30 and would go to 5.30. They had tremendous flexibility, not only with their, their schedule, but <clears throat> we also allowed them to follow the rules and regulations of the college versus the rules and regulations of the school system. For example, in our school system, you couldn't leave lunch uh, campus to go to lunch in a lot of our high schools but you could if that was part of the college uh, rules and regulations. Uh, we gave them a great deal of flexibility with the curriculum, and we allowed students who, who met college requirements to take college courses for dual high school college credit. So you could easily see how different uh, that would be. We, we had kids who wore hats to class. We had kids who drank uh, soft drink or ate peanuts in class. Fascinating, though, they all when, when they finished uh, their their bag of peanuts, they get up and quietly walk over and drop the empty container into the trash can. Uh, al along with that great flexibility came uh, the core value of responsibility, and it was so <clears throat> fascinating when we had teachers and principals from our traditional high schools visit these schools and all of a sudden see students who had a history in their former schools of being disrespectful of being suspended from schools for noncompliance, for not doing their work, uh, all of a sudden uh, having B plus, A minus, A averages were doing college level work. And it was very difficult for a lot of our, our principals and our teachers to come to grips with the fact that they were being, kids were being so much more successful in these types of environments than they were back in traditional schools. Mm -hmm. Terry, before we leave um, the, uh, this section with regard to smaller classes and enrollment, and also um, uh, not stated was uh, transportation is provided for the students and et cetera, which, uh, how then would this program be cost effective for a school district? 
Well, it's interesting. We, we, interesting. We, we did our own study and we did our own analysis, and we found the first year, the very first year, cost us about $300, $350 more per kid than in a traditional school because, uh, as you hear me talk a little later in the program, uh, we had to pay for startup costs, for example, we had to pay to install telephone service in the, at the college and university. Now, they were letting us use the, uh, the space for free, but we had to, to put copiers in. We had to put telephone systems in. Uh, we bought computer and furnished computer labs for the kids. So we had some original startup costs, and we had smaller class size. Our average class size there was, 50, uh, was between well, 15 and 20 kids per class. But then the other side of that nickel is, and we were providing uh, transportation, but once you got the program up and running, we found in years two, three, four, and five that we were spending about 450 to $500 less per student because yeah. we no longer were paying for uh, a media center. We weren't buying books to go into that media center. We were not paying utility costs. Mm -hmm. We were not paying for outside maintenance. We were not paying cafeteria workers. Uh, we, we were not paying custodial staff. Uh, we weren't providing an assistant principal. So, so those other additional overhead costs uh, were, uh, would, would help offset the cost of a middle college uh, because of the way it was structured and the fact that it was on a campus where they were not charging you to use the space. Mm -hmm. That, that's uh, that's really interesting. Uh, thank you for uh, for sharing that. Uh, also, you uh, you talk uh, about middle college governance and some of the operational logistics. Uh, you might want to talk, tell us a little bit about that. Well, the the program in, in Guilford and what we would recommend all over are that it be governed by the local board of education. Uh, for example, the Board of Education establishes how many units of credit you have to have for graduation. Uh, they establish the standards for your, your teachers. <clears throat> it is still under the control of the local board, uh, but the district and the host college collaboratively manage that program. For example, you heard me talk about this. The host college provides space for the program, like a principal's office, a teacher workroom, uh, a dedicated classroom for every 25 students, that means that uh, we would, would have a classroom that college kids didn't use. We only use that in, in those classrooms. But then they gave us access to floating classrooms or classrooms that were vacant during the school day that college kids weren't using, for example, like science laboratories or computer labs, the media center, et cetera. Uh, I remember at one of the middle colleges that we were, uh, started there, uh, in Guilford, uh, we had some real issues with the college uh, faculty senate uh, because one of the senate leaders was a biology teacher, and he was just having a fit over us use our kids using the biology lab. So I actually went as superintendent and attended the faculty senate meeting, and got beat up for a while until finally I had a chance <laughs> to speak, and I said, "Well." I'm a former biology teacher, and I would guess you are concerned that your equipment might be broken or that we're using your supplies and your chemicals, et cetera. And he, he, he just kind of blurted out. He said, you bet your bottom dollar I am. <laughs> and I said, well, suppose I will just uh, – what, what if I just write a letter and sign it to say that if we use it or break it, we buy it? Mm. And he got very quiet, and uh -huh. he said, oh, I said, and what else might you need in your biology lab that you currently don't have that our kids and your kids could share? And he said, well, I, 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 it would be nice if I had a, a different microscope. And what, what might that cost? Well, I'll get back with you. I said, we'll provide it as long as it's reasonable. Mm -hmm. And it was also interesting at that particular college, another complaint that the faculty senate had was, well, your, 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 your high school kids, are, they're taking up all the space on the benches. And I said, what benches? And they said, well, outside around the trees, the benches. I said, well, how many more benches would you like? What do you mean? I said, well, how many more benches would it take for you to be happy that you, we, we would need more benches? And so we came up with a number. Well, we purchased the benches. Now, we still own the benches. If the program ever leaves, the benches will come back to the school district. But it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. if, if you go to a middle college and you guys visited there in North Carolina, one of the ways you can tell on a college campus who the middle college kids are is college kids will walk around in groups of two and three. Middle college kids seem to track around in groups of seven or eight. <laughs> And it's that security, particularly that, that first or second year, uh, of how they bond and, and fit together. But the point I'm trying to make is that 
uh, while they provide uh, those uh, the space for the program, uh, what we see is that you sometimes have to step in and you have to be willing yourself to be flexible and you have to, to help that, that university make that transition originally. Now the district, we provided the telephones, the computers, the copying machine, the office furniture. We bought the high school textbooks and materials and we decided that if students took courses for college credit, we would pay the tuition and the textbooks for our middle college students. We could still do all those things, and it still cost us, after year one, $450 to $500 less uh, per kid. Uh, the district also selected uh, our employees. We trained all teachers and administrative staff. Um, you heard me say earlier that the, the middle college kids abide by the college rules and regulations. Uh, even though at the, at the end of the day, the school district, the Board of Education would make decisions pertaining to student discipline if that was an issue. Our kids knew that the only real regulations that we had at that university that came down from the district was, number one, if you go into a dormitory for, for any reason, if you go into a dorm and we find it out, you're going back to, to traditional school. If you do drugs and we find it out, you're going back to traditional school. Mm -hmm. Past that, uh, they knew if they, they would behave and abide by the college rules and regulations, uh, you know, frankly, they were, they were good to go. Now, our middle college high school principal reported to a, one of my central office assistants, but it was very important that we had a strong relationship with that college faculty. So our middle college principal attended all college faculty meetings. And what we also saw across the country when we were looking was that most successful middle college programs had a college faculty member who kind of served as a liaison, who, who was a troubleshooter between the college faculty and the middle college program. For example, if, if we were using one of their classrooms and the, the kids for whatever reason, weren't pleasing up after themselves and leaving trash on the on the floor. That middle college liaison would come over, talk to our principal, the principal would go talk to the teacher, that problem was handled. Because what we used to say to our kids is, it is it's an honor to be here. And this is a place you like. Don't misbehave, don't mess this up for yourself or for, or for other kids. So that was important. I would suggest to anyone that's looking at implementing a middle college high school program to visit Guilford County. Uh, I think they have the strongest program, middle college programs in the country. I know I'm a little biased, but I, I visited others all over the country. They have a lot of different models, as Marty pointed out. And so you can, they have an all boys middle college high school. They have an all girls middle college high school. They have them on uh, private colleges. They have them on public universities. They have them on community colleges. There's just a, a array of differences. But I would suggest anyone wanting to start to visit there or other uh, successful middle colleges. And when you go, uh, take with you school principals, take with you uh, the president or provost of your local community college, uh, and, and even take student leaders, uh, particularly from the university level, when you go out and, and visit other, other middle college programs. Terry, uh, um, part of your comments suggested that um, maybe not all students actually take college coursework. Um, that um, that perhaps they would uh, just take their high school work on the on on the campus of the of the college. So yeah, and that was probably one of the bigger differences between our middle college approach and the middle early college approach of the Gates Foundation uh, in North Carolina and other places. They pretty much wanted to recruit kids, many of whom would have been uh, first uh, college goers from a family, but they were recruiting kids that had the the academic potential kind of early on to to take college courses during their junior and senior year, we made it very clear uh, at our place that our number one priority above all else was high school graduation. Small college class size, hand-picked empathetic teachers, high expectations, do what it takes, get kids out of high school. Now, as part of that, once a kid's academic skill set evolved to the point and their, 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 their interest level uh, uh, kicked in and they saw college courses that they wanted to take, we said, great, go for it. And again, that uh, we worked through that college-university liaison. 
We got kids scheduled into courses. Like Marty said earlier, we had very flexible schedules uh, where kids could could take high school courses in the morning and college courses in the afternoon or vice versa. But our first number one priority, Terry, was high school graduation first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, What about um, selecting staff? Um, um, Well, I can tell you, I think that's one of the most, uh, that's the key to middle college uh, success. The most important person you will pick, and I believe the first staff person you should select should be a principal. Uh, that principal is is has to be like a symphony conductor. He he really must understand and have a clear sense of purpose about what middle colleges are designed to do. He's got to be able to confront irresponsible behavior on behalf of students and teachers. Must remain firm in pressing for a, a positive direction and has to be able to work with well with adults. And working well with adults and kids, I think, is the key because not only do you have to, to – that, that principal is going to be key in selecting the right staff, they're going to be, have to be able to work with the, the college provost, with the president, other, other members of the college senate. Uh, that is just absolutely, uh, no question, absolutely uh, key. Uh, that principal has to be uh, willing to help you select teachers who are empathetic, Listeners, they have to have high expectations and be facilitators of of the learning process. Now, we made some decisions that we were going to establish uh, a a uniform interview technique that asked the same questions to all teachers. And the questions that we ask screen for certain characteristics. And we, over the years, have used several national models. Uh, right now, the model that they're using, or I believe they're using in Guilford, we're using it here in San Diego Unified, is uh, Martin Haberman's work out of the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And uh, Dr. Haberman established the star principal, star teacher interview process. And we ask a series of, of 11 to, to 12 questions to teachers and their situational questions. What would you do if? What would happen? Uh, how would you respond when? And it's a, a set of probing questions that you, once a teacher ask, uh, ask answers, you ask a follow-up question and sometimes a follow-up question. And you have a set of rubrics that you measure, uh, that you, you rate their, their answers against. And it has been a very successful technique to help us identify what we refer to as second chance empathetic teachers. Uh, Teachers that if a child didn't turn in a term paper versus giving that kid a zero or an F, you could put your arm on the kid's shoulder and say, look, why didn't, Terry, why didn't you do this term paper? And it would would, would break your heart sometimes to listen to what I have heard from kids and what I've heard teachers tell about why kids didn't do their work. And the teacher then would say, well, next time you come tell me this up front, and, and I'll help you through it. But in the meantime, you're going to stay after school every day this week. You're going to go over to the media center. We'll work on this paper, and I'll take you home. I'll give you a ride home, and we're going to get this paper done. And maybe at the end of the day, your highest mark on the paper, if it's perfect, would be an 85 or a 90, but it's not going to be a zero. And it's teachers that just aren't willing to let kids fail. It's mm-hmm. teachers who teach, uh, assess, Go back and reteach as teachers who understand mastery learning, as teachers who understand the power many times of cooperative learning, uh, of relevance, of rigor, and relationship. And it's um, we found in, in Guilford that in most cases, a middle college program that had 125 to 130 kids would have a principal, a secretary, a guidance counselor, and seven high school teachers. And we've had a lot of people say, well, why in the world would you give a a, a small school of 125 to 135 kids a counselor? A lot of these kids have a lot of really, really serious issues that account – that counselor, I promise you, is working full-time, day and night, full-time, around the clock on the weekends. Most of the teachers in middle college, uh, the kids have their cell phone numbers. They call them on the weekends. The kids call the the teachers – there, there is a, a sense of community that is uh, very hard to describe. I know when uh, we started the middle college high school when I was superintendent in, in a district near Nashville, Tennessee, um, the principal at this middle college uh, on the way to work got a speeding ticket. 
and he was laughing and telling me about it. And he said, you know, when I got to uh, when I got to school, he said I hadn't been there five minutes, and here they came. It was a contingency of of six to eight middle college kids, and they came up and they had a business card and. They said to me, Mr. Ford, uh, we know you got a ticket on the way to work. Uh, here is the name of an attorney in town. He can get your ticket reduced from speeding down to improper equipment, and it will keep your insurance from going up $1,000 a year. And Harold was just laughing about how street smart most of these kids are, but ha- absolutely how dedicated they were to each other. He told me another story I thought was fantastic when he was talking about uh, these these kids at the end of the first year – they started doing uh, advertising and letting people know it was time to apply for the next year. And again, a group came to see him and said, Mr. Ford, how do, you, how do you decide who gets to come to our school? And he explained about the interview process and so forth. And one of them said, well, we want to be part of the student selection part process because we don't want all of those troublemakers coming to our school. Mm. <laughs> and Harold started laughing. He said, boy, are you talking about the pottle calling the, uh, uh, the, the pan uh, black? He said, you know, gee whiz, guys, uh, weren't you troublemakers when you were in school? And he said they looked at him with a deadpan face and said that was just a phase we were going through. <laughs> well, I have to say from the visit that um, there were several things that struck me, and some of it made it into the film. And one was Dr. McCary saying there cannot be a single weak link. I was just so affected by that. And uh, this staff selection piece speaks to that Mm -hmm. so uh, importantly. And the other thing that um, you're alluding to here is this sense of family that these staff have established with these young people in these small learning communities is something I rarely see, and it was um, an amazing experience and I, I support your invitation to to go to Guilford County. And uh, if anybody out there listening to this would like uh, some contact information, do contact us here at the center, NDPC at Clemson.edu, and we can get you to the right folks there. But uh, Dr. Greer, almost said Terry. Dr. Greer, do you have any comments about that phrase about not a single weak link? I totally agree, and it's interesting about that concept of family and teacher dedication. Uh, one of the best teachers I've ever ever known was a teacher at the uh, Middle College High School at um, Guilford Technical Community College in Jamestown, and her hu- husband was offered a huge promotion in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it was going to require them to move. And she just had such a hard time leaving her school and her kids mm-hmm. that they basically decided that versus him living there and she staying in Guilford and they having a distance marriage, they bought a, a place halfway in between. And so she commuted 45 minutes to and from work every day because she just could not give up her kids. Mm-hmm. And it, it's every year. I mean, you go back there during the, uh, the holidays, during a break. Every year, every middle college is besieged by former graduates. The kids that come back to see those teachers in the summer, they come back during the holiday breaks. And when you go there, it is just such a it, – it just makes you so proud. And you, you just uh, – it's, it's really an emotional experience to go be part of it. I can tell you that when I would have really tough times as a superintendent, and I promise you superintendents have tough days, uh, I could go to the middle college and sit down and talk with those kids, talk with those teachers, and, you know, it was just like a cell phone whose battery had died, and all of a sudden you plugged it into a, <laughs> into a charger, and it just charged your soul. Well, and that is absolutely what you see on the faces of not only the, the children, the young people, but the teachers, the principals, a uh, district office. Everybody just lights up. They talk about the graduations. Uh, everybody just is on a high on that, so it's... Um, it's kind of a, a wonderful experience to go. It I, is, and I'll add this real quick too, Marty. It, it didn't start that way. Uh, we started out with two. I went to work there in 2000, uh, 2001. We started two middle college high schools, and you would have thought that would have been enough. And we just kept growing them because it just kept meeting the needs of so many kids. But uh, in 2003, we had a turnover on our school board, which was massive. We had a large board of 11 members, and about half of that board turned over, and many of whom ran on the platform of doing away with middle colleges because we were starting middle college high schools and in very tough financial times where we were literally cutting millions of dollars out of our budget 
But at the same time, we convinced the board that this was a, a money-making strategy because kids that drop out of school, you get no state revenue for those kids. And if you look at the dropout rate, uh, the eight years I was there, it was about 6% a year when I got there, which was about 24%. Last year, we cut it in more than in half. It was down to about 2.9% a year, which was the lowest dropout rate that we mm. could find among the nation's top largest 60 school districts. Well, uh, it's time to move on, and it's funny. I just got a question on email that pertains to the next section, and it's about student selection. I guess um, this uh, writer uh, who saw, named Sam, saw that it was um, about uh, that topic was coming up, and so he wants to know about the types of students served in the programs. Uh, Are they ideally suited for just a particular type of student? Do they serve all the students? Do they serve only the brightest students? And I think we were also talking earlier about this issue about the brightest students, if, if there were some who had reading difficulties, Dr. Cash and I were discussing that. So why don't we get into this section sure. now about student selection, and you could kind of elaborate sure. on some of those points from, our, from our, our writer here. Well, the program you heard me say earlier was designed primarily for kids who had been disengaged from high, the high school learning process. These may be very bright kids. As a matter of fact, we saw kids who were walking around with classics under their arm and Stephen King novels, uh, but who had failed English 1 or English 2 because they wouldn't come, they were disengaged. These students' grades and, and interest in school often, if you go back and look at their report cards and transcript, Many of them were, were relatively strong until early, early adolescence, until they got into middle school, and then all of a sudden they really started declining, and, and it really started going downhill fast. And we, we, we saw that many of those kids, again, you heard me say earlier, would not attend school on a regular basis. They, they didn't participate in classes. They found a, an interesting un, that, that were not relevant to what they wanted to, to do. They couldn't see a connection. Uh, they didn't participate in extracurricular activities. So, so this program is not for everyone. You, you take a kid that's, you know, got A-B average, he's, he's coming to school, has a 95, 96% attendance rate, he's on the football team. Uh, it's not for that kid. Uh, it, it's for that disconnected kid. It, but it is also for kids that must be interested in turning their academic careers around. And I say for students that must be interested, sometimes, frankly, it's the student and or their parents. Uh, many times it's a parent that just keeps hagging and nagging and pushing on kids to, do, to, to try to make it, and the kid will fall into a middle college program and, and, and think, well, geez, you know, I'll try this to just kind of get my mom to leave me alone. Once they get there, I'm telling you, they're hooked. Uh, I, I, I had a, a, a very good friend in, in Guilford when I was there, a, a, a gentleman who was a professional in the community, and uh, his son was a, a very, very talented um, athlete. And the kid had dropped out of school. He'd gotten in some trouble with the law, had, had given up, and had quit, and his parents just tried to get him to go back to school, tried to get him to go back to school, and he wouldn't go. He said, I'm not going back where people know I've been in trouble, they're going to make fun of me, etc." His mother and father were distraught. They came to me. I got the kid in my office. I talked to him. I said, listen, here's the deal. I want you to give middle college a try. You try it for three days. In the three days, if you don't like it, you never have to go back. I'll never say another word to you. You go on and get on with your life. He went three days. It was interesting. Uh, he had lost his driving privileges. The principal of that school went and picked him up and took him to, to school every day. A teacher who lived near him took him home every day. Um, this kid ended up sticking it out, graduated from high school, is enrolled back in that community college, uh, and is now in his, is in his second year there. Uh, it's a, a tremendous experience, but it's it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's not for everyone. Some kids are so far behind academically that a GED, a graduate equivalence degree, might better serve those kids who need a significant number of credits to graduate. Uh, we do tell the middle college kids coming in they have to go through an interview, uh, they have to fill out an application, they must be willing to accept responsibility for their social behavior as well as their academic behavior because we talk to them about going on a college campus and what that means. And they know that if they don't abide by those rules, they're going to be sent back to what we refer to as their home school, but what they call real school. They refer to traditional <laughs> high schools as real school, and they don't want to go back to real school. 
This is different. This is special. This is a place for them. So it's uh, it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting that teachers. Uh, we started out with teachers or counselors or high school principals nominating these students, and we looked for kids who had horrible attendance rates, uh, who had had past academic problems, uh, and and that's kind of uh, you know that's kind of what we looked at. Kids that didn't participate in school activities. What we found after we got started, uh, believe it or not our best recruiting tool was other kids. They know kids just like them Mm -hmm. out in the world. And and I can promise you, they would refer kids in, and they they knew kids who were having trouble adjusting. And so it became a little referral service in and of itself. And so the the school holds an interview with uh, each of the kids, and at the interview, the parent and guardian must also come. And we ask them very pointed questions, we try to find out what created stress in their, their personal and academic life. And what we told them is once you're accepted into the program, uh, you and your parents both must sign contracts agreeing to expected levels of effort and compliance with rules and regulations. I remembered attending several open houses at middle college on middle college campuses, and it was amazing. Uh, we would go to open houses and have 100% parent participation. Mm-hmm. And these were parents who had never, ever gone to an open house before in a traditional school. It's amazing. And it basically it was these teachers co- convincing the kids that, that this was a partnership between home and school and that we valued their parents as well. And we had parents that would, would come to these open houses that we'd never seen at an open house before. Well, uh, Terry, I'm um, looking at your monograph, and certainly at the um, at the end in the appendix, you have a uh, sample student application um, questionnaire, and et cetera, and it's very comprehensive. Um, obviously, um, you did a lot of work and effort in putting this together to really be able to get a good um, background on the students before they came. We did, and it, 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 again, it was a passion and. And I can tell you, there's a there's a personal story here. My wife Nancy and I have been married for 10 years. We we got married when I was the superintendent in Williamson County School District, right south of Nashville, Tennessee, before I went to Guilford County. And um, we had just started a middle college high school program there when Nancy's youngest daughter came to live with us. And uh, I didn't think, and Nancy didn't think, uh, she'd been living with her dad for a number of years, and uh, she had. Um, been held back between kindergarten and first grade, and you would ask her what grade she was in, and she'd say, well, I'm in the seventh grade, but I should be in the eighth, and she was a great kid, but she was an absolute poster child for middle college. We had all kind of trouble getting her up to go to to school. She would lay in the bed with the door locked and the alarm clock going off like crazy, and you thought, how can anyone sleep through this? And then when you finally roused her and get her out, you know, it was just a battle to get her to go to school. And we were finding she was, uh, we'd drop her off at school, but she'd meet up with kids and cut school, and we were having all kind of problems. And we had just started this middle college, and again, I said to her, look, you don't like school. I want you to try middle college. You go three days, and you don't like it. Uh, you can you can quit if that's what you want. You can go back to live with your dad. You can do whatever you want to do, and we're going to quit hounding on you. Uh, three days later, she was singing in the shower. She was up. Well, you got to get me to school. It was it was absolutely the most transforming experience that I could ever explain to you. Uh, today, she graduated from college, and she is a second grade teacher uh, in a school district in North Carolina, and is just a phenomenal young woman. Well, that's that's not the only story of this because I met a lot of those kind of kids, and I'm so happy that it happened for her and for these other students. But it, it begs a question with me because we all know that. Uh, retention is one of the uh, major issues about uh, dropout, that if you've been retained once, there's a 50% or more chance you'll drop out, and then twice, 90%. And some of these students have been retained because they've been disengaged. So yes. are, is, do you see that many of the students who attend the middle college are students who are over age for grade? Absolutely, and that was one of the things that we looked for. We would go back and scour those transcripts and we would look for kids that were overaged. Mm -hmm. And we knew if we didn't find a way to help those kids that they'd leave us. And it's that it is that really tension between social promotion and doing what you have to do to make sure you accelerate kids learning when they start slow and and get behind 
that I think is a, a huge, huge, huge issue for a lot of school superintendents, uh, principals, teachers, and school board members around the country. And we found that uh, middle colleges were a, 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 we thought, one strategy, one solution to help us get at that. Well, and it's certainly a wonderful psychological lift to be on a college campus, which I think brings us to our next section. It's very difficult to explain. I mean, it's one of the hardest explanations I think I've ever tried to offer in education. We all understand, that have had children, understand the power of peer pressure. We, we know that kids... Uh, friends can have more influence on them sometimes than, than their ministers, than their parents, than other adults. But that power of the college campus is really the key to successful middle college programs. Um, it's a magical bridge. It reconnects, disconnect to your high school kids um, uh, to learning. It, it makes them feel special. Uh, they the the power for them to start looking like, dressing like, acting like, studying like, achieving like college kids is just absolutely phenomenal. I've seen kids at middle college. I remember this kid in, in Guilford when I went out to visit after the middle college he got started. His hair, he used a tube of Elmer's glue every day to glue his hair in a Max the Road Warrior type of, of mohawk. <laughs> and I went in and this kid said, you know, I know who you are. And I said, you do? He said, yeah, you, you're the guy. I said, the guy? You know, the head guy. I said, oh, okay, the superintendent. Yeah, that's it. He said, how do you like my hair? I said, I think your hair is pretty cool. How do you like middle college high school? He said, yeah, but how do you like my hair? I said, I told you, I like your hair. How do you like middle college? He looked right at me and he said, you know, he said, here, no one says anything about my hair. I said, well, Everybody thinks your hair is cool. They're more interested in your, your, your academic. They're more academics. They're more interested in you as a person. And it was I came back right before the winter break, and he no longer had his hair up in, in, in the glued mohawk. It was shoulder length. He had peroxided it absolute cotton white, <laughs> and uh, but it was shoulder length. I came back during right before spring break, and his hair had been cut, and his hair was the the, the his natural color and. He just looked like another kid, and he said to me, he said, well, I'm the hair kid. And I looked at him, I said, I think you used to be the hair kid. I just think you're the kid now. What do you think? <laughs> and he laughed, and he said, well, it just didn't seem to be a big issue here. And mm -hmm. I said, well, what is the big issue? And he said, that's why I love it here. He said, there is no issue. He said, there is no, no drama here. He said, here, Mr., we are all middle college. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it was phenomenal, that power of that college campus. Uh, they, they, kids actually feel like college students. You give them more uh, flexibility and freedom, but along with that goes the responsibility of behaving like kids. Those core high school classes are taught by very carefully selected, what you've heard me refer to mm -hmm. as a second chance high school teacher. And those kids have access to college facilities. You know, they can sit around in the commons area. They can watch widescreen TV between classes. The flexibility that we have, we run those middle colleges on the college and university schedule. Most of them are not run uh, exclusively on the high school schedule. So we tried to set them up where, where and when we could so that we, we, when colleges began, middle colleges began. When colleges were out on break, we were out on break. So we tried to have that same exact schedule if, as if, if we could, and we let them take college courses when they qualified and gave them a high school and college credit uh, as well. Those older college kids, uh, they exerted a great deal of positive pressure on middle college kids to fit in and become responsible members of that of that college campus. And we found, and we're very surprised by this, that um, the college students, because they were older, seemed to be more accepting of kids that were different, that started out dressing differently or looked differently um, than traditional high school kids uh, who many times uh, would start the school year with designer jeans on, designer sneakers, uh, and, and dressed totally different than than what we saw at, at, on a community college or even a college campus. Um, we also found that that campus, by letting kids take college courses that really helped them bridge this relevance gap, really helped them see the relationship between schooling and their future. And we, we believe that 
uh, that was one of the keys. And as you heard me say earlier, in, in some of our middle colleges there, as many as 66% of those kids uh, would continue at that local community college and go on and get a two-year associate's degree, and then many of those would go on and get a four-year degree from a, from a local college or university. The exciting thing about North Carolina is if you – the courses that you take on a community college campus there and make C or higher, all those courses by law are transferable into the state university system. Hmm. Well, I think we met a lot of students who in their earlier life never thought that they were college material or that college wasn't for them or they had never seen their future, including college. And all of a sudden here on this campus, it's like there's this whole world open to them that they didn't know existed and all these opportunities and careers. Well, Marty, it, it broke the cycle. You know, kids that had, had come from families where no one had ever graduated from high school, much less even been on a college campus, and now all of a sudden here are these kids who realize they can do the work and do do the work and go on and, and get associate degrees or four-year degrees. It just changes an entire community and it changes the lives of families. I have been sitting in, standing in grocery stores in the checkout line, and people walk up, men and women, and just throw their arms around me and start crying and start telling stories about middle college and how it saved their child's life or how their grandson now is a diesel mechanic making $60,000 a year and how proud they are of him or how this one kid who was a middle college student at the end of his first year at North Carolina State University was their top ranked freshman at the mm, end of the year, wow. number one in his class, a middle college high school student from uh, the middle college at Guilford Technical Community College. Wow. We've got another email um, question. I think our listeners today are shy about talking with you, Dr. Greer. <laughs> <laughs> They're writing me messages instead. And let me read this one from Bev. A lot of what you're saying about factors that allow kids to do well in middle college programs are the same factors regarding the success of students in flexible alternative education programs. Do you see middle college programs as a replacement for alternative programs, or do we still need both? Yeah, I think you probably need both. I would hope that you would need uh, uh, wouldn't need either. To me, the whole concept of, of schooling has to be flexibility. Uh, we just uh, this year are open, opening uh, San Diego Unified's first virtual high school. And it's not just a virtual high school where you can take all the courses you need to graduate from high school online. Uh, it's also going to be centers where you can do independent study. It's going to be – they're going to be centers where online you can do credit recovery for courses that you've already failed. You could go to one of our traditional high schools in the morning. You could take all online courses in the afternoon. If you were a professional uh, gymnast or, or tennis player or golfer, it gives you great flexibility to be able to, to continue your education while you're on the road. So the key, I think, has to be flexibility. Uh, you, you may have alternative schools for kids that have such – behavioral problems that they would have trouble mm -hmm. um, adapting to a college campus. And so I do think that you have to have some, some flexibility to offer kids options. But I think this whole key of options, flexibility, and choice is going to be the key to high school, uh, the, the future of the high school in America. Terry, um, you talk about some of the lessons learned um, in your book, but what, what are some of the challenges um, that a superintendent or a school district would face if they wanted to start a, a middle college program? Well, of course, you're going to always get pushed back because it's changed, Terry. It's different. <laughs> and I heard and have heard forever that if these kids would just conform, you wouldn't need to do this. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> okay, but but you know, if we did this, we wouldn't have a thirty percentage dropout rate like we do in San Diego right now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we either have to find ways to meet the needs of our children, or our children are going to continue to drop out. And if they can continue to drop out, our social welfare and prison system in this country are going to continue to be burdened. Uh, we know without question that. One of the, the biggest things that all prisoners have in common is a lack of quality education. We also know that if African-American youngster, particularly a young man in this country, drops out of high school, 85 percent of them will end up incarcerated before they're 25 years of age. So do we just keep doing what we've been doing because what we do serves affluent kids 
usually very well, not always, but usually very well, or do we look at having options that meet the needs of kids versus trying to take kids and forcing them into a one-size-fits-all traditional high school? I just wanted to throw one other thing in here that's going on in Guilford County. You'd be interested to hear this. Uh, the news services are doing a story on uh, the Solutions webcast, and the young student intern who was writing the article went to um, and maybe early middle college at UNC Greensboro. Yes. And um, she, of course, wanted to say hi to Dr. Greer. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but there are other options, I think, at Guilford College also. Could you just take a minute to just uh, share with our listeners the fact that that there uh, are those students who may not be in danger of dropping out, but who have educational options that are more in, um, stretching in other ways? Well, it's interesting. One of the different models there was the uh, the middle college at Greensboro College. And Greensboro College in, in Guilford County is a, a very, very fine liberal arts school. But it's one of the different middle college models. Uh, most of those kids are kids that, for whatever reason, if you go in and talk to them, they'll tell you, yes, I've given thought to dropping out. But the bigger issue with them, with most of them, they maybe wouldn't have dropped out, but they were absolutely bored to tears. Uh, they felt like misfits. Uh, they didn't belong. They, they felt sometimes like they were outcast. And we know, we know firsthand from research and just our own practical experiences that many times uh, when you are in school, uh, particularly with females, that you get kids that, that get into cliques and then for whatever reason, they will exclude other girls. And that exclusion is very painful. And so we found all kinds of of other reasons besides just not being successful academically uh, that that helped some kids or, or made some kids long for a different type of educational experience. And that's what we had, at, at, particularly at Greensboro College. Well, that's um, um, clearly... I think that um, when we start talking about school reform, that uh, uh, clearly there should be pathways to graduation. And as you so aptly said, not a one-size-fits-all. And uh, uh, clearly this model has uh, has shown tremendous success and promise um, across the nation. Um, I've seen several different uh, models uh, in addition to yours, and... Uh, certainly suggests that uh, it is um, it's not for everyone, no. but for those uh, uh, for a great number of students, it is highly successful and really, as you have said, save their lives um, almost literally and certainly academically. Well, it's interesting. Uh, one of the other models in Guilford was uh, the the um, Middle College of Entertainment Technology. It was a theme middle college that had a particular theme. And it was located in High Point, North Carolina, on the campus of uh, uh, Guilford Technical Community College at High Point. And Larry Gatlin, uh, who was the country singer, uh, worked with the uh, universe, uh, worked with the Guilford Technical Community College to set up this center in High Point that was a entertainment technology community college. And so the kids who went to our high school there. Uh, they learn to do things like, uh, you know, how do you how do you design and manage a, a stage production crew for in the music industry? How do you design CD jackets? Uh, how do you mix music? Uh, how do you do television, radio broadcast? But it was just absolutely fascinating. I remember like it was yesterday, the last time I visited there, uh, that college, that high school opened its doors at 11 or 11.30, but I was talking to these teachers who who's, who had this group of African-American young men who now were, were pushing and pressing on them to get to work at 8 o'clock in the morning because these kids wanted to get in and have access to some of the recording and mixing equipment because they were so excited and motivated about school. Uh, this one kid had developed this, all, this, this CD. It was a, a film of himself, and he, it, was, it was the film of him playing three different characters in this film. And it was absolutely amazing, and you were just uh, – you were almost flabbergasted by watching this kid's talent as he was playing three different characters, this one kid, in this same film clip that he had produced about himself. 
Mm-hmm. And the talent that, that he demonstrated, mm-hmm. and here was a kid that without this middle uh, college experience would have never had this type of outlet to demonstrate the talent. There's no question. There's no question in my mind this kid's going to be a big-time player sometime in the future in the entertainment world. Well, that's mm-hmm. exciting. I think in this day and age of budget cuts and um, dropout crisis, the collaboration that you fostered in Guilford County is a wonderful model of how uh, schools and colleges, universities, technical colleges can work together in a cost-saving way to save and rescue so many kids. I think there's over 500 students uh, enrolled in these different colleges Pretty right now. Pretty close to 1,000 now, Marty. Oh, my word. So I mean, you're talking about a lot of students, and most of them are really, as they say, they, they're being rescued. Well, I, I used to say to the school board in Guilford, if you went out and built a new small high school to house all of these kids that would have dropped out or, or they're not going to your other high schools now, you know, you would have spent fifty, sixty million dollars building that school and then look at what you would pay to operate it in terms of hiring custodians and cafeteria workers and groundskeepers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just for that school that these kids are now being educated on on local college and community college campuses. So this is a huge cost savings. I always also though think I need to add small schools just having small schools is not enough. It's not enough. You talked about lessons learned. It's how you have those small schools. It's who teaches in those small schools. It's who leads those small schools. It's about having small schools that are organized with great flexibility, that selects kids that are disconnected. It's just having a school that's small by itself is not the answer. Well, uh, once again, the hour has flown by, and we certainly hope our listeners have found today's program and the resources provided a a good starting point for their own exploration uh, into middle college uh, um, and another exciting uh, opportunity for um, an intervention strategy for for our kids most at risk. Yes, and uh, Dr. Cash, uh, we want to thank our listeners uh, of this radio webcast, like all our monthly programs, are archived on our website, so you can go back and listen again, and re- recommend this to your friends and colleagues that they listen as well. And you can use the archive program for your professional development activity, another cost-saving device because it's all free, and provide it uh, for your entire faculty meeting or, gr- or community group. And I want to thank our guest for this month, Dr. Terry Greer, Superintendent of San Diego Schools, California. Uh, Terry, you've given us plenty of information and resources to get started in this important area. It's now up to each of us to explore further what you've presented and to begin to apply these solutions to our work in ending the dropout crisis. Now, Terry Greer, (laughs) this is is very complicated for me today. Thank you again for joining us. I know you are very busy out there in San Diego dealing with a lot of issues, but we appreciate your joining with us today and providing all this information for our listeners. It has been a pleasure, you guys. I think it's easy to see that I'm, I'm very, very passionate about trying to provide our kids with options and trying to find ways to meet their needs. I don't think there ought to be a reason that any kid in America drops out of high schools, and we've, we've got to work together to find that solution. Well, I think that uh, passion has always come through with you, Terry, and how you care about these students and what, you've, what you're actually doing to help them. It's fantastic, and San Diego's lucky to have you. These good, ra- yeah, go ahead. Good to be with both of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Our radio webcast will be broadcast monthly after the holidays are over. And besides the new theme song, we have another change. We've been promoted to the second Tuesday of each month in order to accommodate all the holiday schedules throughout the year. So check our webpage for the exact dates of, the, of each broadcast. The next one will be set for Tuesday, January 13th. And we've got, uh, Terry, a wonderful list of programs for next year lining up on parent involvement, career technology education, virtual learning, and uh, something we learned about in Georgia last week, graduation coaches. This current webcast will be available to listen again on our website, www.dropoutprevention.org, within the next two hours. And it's Don Laudable uh, on your iPod or MP3 players. Hey, it's also available on iTunes. You guys need to subscribe. I subscribe, and uh, you can get every month's program and listen to it while you walk around the block. 
Well, thanks to all of you for listening and participating. Remember, we know why students are dropping out of school, and with research-based solutions, we can ensure that all our students graduate. Join us next month for more solutions to the dropout crisis.